Hello and welcome. I'm Masood Raja and in this brief lecture I will be discussing an excerpt from Franz Fanon's first book, Black Skin, White Masks, which was published in 1952. Now, this was Fanon's first work. You're probably already familiar with Fanon. If not, please watch my lecture on him. But uh, to be like clear, Fanon was originally from Martinique, which was an old French colony, and trained as a psychoanalyst, worked in Algeria, and Black Skin, White Masks was actually his first book published in French and then translated into different languages. And the book was published in 1952, and I believe Fanon was then 27. So what I'll do is, since this is not a very long excerpt, I will go ahead and read it. It will take me a few minutes, of course, and then come back and we can talk about what I would have just read or what I've just read. Now, I also highly recommend that you should read the text and then watch this video, and I will, of course, make the link to this text available and also upload it, depending on which medium that you're using. So here I will read the text and maybe talk about the text while I'm reading it, but then also come back and conclude our discussion. The way of conclusion, and this is the conclusion of the book itself, the problem considered here is one of time. Those Negroes and white men will be disalienated who refuse to let themselves be sealed away in the materialized tower of the past. For many other Negroes, in other ways, disalienation will come into being through their refusal to accept the present as definitive. I'm a man, and what I have to recapture is the whole past of the world. I'm not responsible solely for the revolt in Santo Domingo. Every time a man has contributed to the victory of the dignity of the spirit, every time a man has said no to an attempt to subjugate his fellows, I have felt solidarity with this act. So these few passages, the most important thing here is the question of disalienation, right? So in order to understand disalienation, we first need to understand what alienation is. So if you come from Marx, there is a certain belief in Marx of a basic humanity that we all possess. And we become alienated from it because of the labor processes in which we produce things that we can't relate to so the purpose of disalienating labor is to reconcile them with who they truly are. Right? Now, Fanon, of course, being a psychoanalyst, is looking also at the psychological alienation and then disalienation. And what he's saying is that the problem of alienation is within time, right? It's temporal because we feel alienated because of our place in history. And unless we take that into consideration, we cannot disalienate ourselves, right? So hence the statement, those Negroes and white men will be disalienated who refuse to let themselves be sealed away in the materialized tower of the past. What is the materialized tower of the past? That is, that if they continue thinking about their selves, their identities, within how they have been treated or how they have treated each other in history, and if they define their own identities through that reference, then they will, of course, remain entrapped within the logic of that history. In some cases, so not making that pass the central point is one path to disalienation. And for the African humans that he's talking about, the Negroes, the disalienation might also come if they think of the present not as fixed, as unchangeable, but as mutable, right? As indefinite, because that's what has the possibility of change. And then he's placing himself, right, he is placing himself in more universalist terms at the end of this great book, right? Where he's saying is that I will not 
just be called someone who can only lay claim to African or black identity. That's why he mentions the Santo Domingo uprising, right? I think it is now uh, part of the uh, Domin Dominican Republic, Republic, right? Because what he's saying is I can lay claim to the entire human history because his project is that in order to find myself, right? And that's the instructive word here. That he will not just derive his identity only from the history of the people of color because that will be caught within the dynamics of the oppressor-oppressed relationship, but rather from the history of the world itself in which he wants to be a fully realized and acknowledged human. So this is what I understand by from the passages that I just read, right? Uh, I will continue reading and then we'll talk a little more about the reading itself and my thoughts on it. So here I go and read again. Way should I dedicate myself to the revival of an unjustly unrecognized Negro civilization? I will not make myself the man of any past. I do not want to exalt the past at the expense of my present and of my future. It is not because the Indo-Chinese has discovered a culture of his own that he is in revolt. It is because, quite simply, it was in more than one way becoming impossible for him to breathe. When one remembers the stories with which in 1938 old regular sergeants described the land of piastres and rickshaws, of cut-rate boys and women, one understands only too well the rage with which the men of the Viet Minh go into battle. An acquaintance, acquaintance with whom I served during the Second World War recently returned from Indochina. He has enlightened me on many things. For instance, the serenity with which young Vietnamese of 16 or 17 faced firing squads. On one occasion, he told me, we had to shoot from a kneeling position. The soldiers' hands were shaking in the presence of those young fanatics. Summing up, he added, the war that you and I were in was only a game compared to what is going on out there. So some more really instructive things in these passages. First of all, what he's trying to say is that in order to articulate my identity, I don't need to go in a past, unrecognized past of my own people and retrieve a certain cultural identity. What he's trying to say is that I can build my identity in the world in which I exist as a human. And that's really crucial to keep in mind and to keep in mind that his views on his, this might change in his later works. But right now what he's trying to foreground is the possibility for an African self to forge an identity in the present and not using historical grievances as something upon which only can that identity be filled. And then he goes into the example of Indochina, of Vietnam, right? And that is the war of Indochina when French were fighting the Vietnamese. The Americans had not yet taken over the battle. And he's describing it from the point of view of some of the people that he had fought with in the Second World War. And how do they see this, right? And what he's saying is that this resolve, this surrender to death that the Vietnamese youth represent or portray cannot be essentialized. You cannot just think that there is an Asian way of dying and we are up against it. What he's saying is that they have come to this point, to this level of fighting at such young ages because the conditions in which they existed had become intolerable. Right? That is the crucial question that when those conditions became intolerable to live as dignified human being, the Viet Minh went to war. And since all they have to claim is their humanity in the present, 
that is how they wage their war and we call them fanatics or whatever and we essentialize them in their prehistory and try to define it as the oriental way of dealing with death that is not what constructs them he's saying but the oppressive conditions which became so unbearable that they had to rise up to change them and he's saying that even the experienced sergeants from the Second World War with whom he fought together right, cannot explain this phenomenon because they are looking at it purely in essentialist terms right? and that the ferocity of this fight is worse than what they think they faced in the Second World War. Right? So that's what comes across to me in these passages. right? Uh, his emphasis that he will not claim his humanity simply through a narrative of historical silencing and victimization, that he will forge his identity in the present as a universal identity and not necessarily as an African identity. And two, when people read these instances of violence and fighting, you know, what they are failing to read is that people are claiming their humanity through this struggle in the present, and it's not an unspoken past that's driving their struggle. So that's kind of my understanding of these passages, and I'll go on and read some more and then talk to you about it. Europe, these things are beyond understanding. There are those who talk of a so-called Asiatic attitude towards that death. But these basement philosophers cannot convince anyone. This Asiatic serenity not so, so long ago was a quality to be seen in the bandits of, war, of workers and the terrorists of the resistance. The Vietnamese who die before the firing squads are not hoping that their sacrifice would bring about the appearance of a past. It is for the sake of the present and of the future that they are willing to die. If the question of practical solidarity with a given past ever arose for me, it did so only to the extent to which I was committed to myself and to my neighbor to fight for all my life and with all my strength so that never again would a people on the earth be subjugated. It was not the black word that laid down my course of conduct. My black skin is not the wrapping of specific values. It is a long time since the starry sky that took away Kant's breath revealed the lots of its secrets to us, and the moral law is not certain of itself. As a man, I undertake to face the possibility of annihilation in order that two or three truths may cast their eternal brilliance over the world. Sartre has shown that in the line of an unauthentic position, the past takes in quantity and when solidly constructed, informs the individual. He is the past in a changed value, but too, I can recapture my past, validate it, or condemn it through my successive choices. The black man wants to be like the white man. For the black man, there is only one dis destiny, and it is white. Long ago, the black man admitted the unarguable superiority of the white man and all his efforts are aimed at achieving a white existence. Have I no other purpose on earth then but to avenge the Negro of the 17th century? In this world, which is already trying to disappear, do I have to pose the problem of black truth? Do I have to be limited to the justification of a facial conformation? I, as a man of color, do not have the right to seek to know in what respect my race is superior or inferior to another race. I, as a man of color, do not have the right to hope that in the white man there will be a crystallization of guilt toward the past of my race. I, as a man of color, do not have the right to seek ways of stamping down the pride of my former master. I have neither the right nor the duty to claim reparation for the domestication of my ancestors. There is no Negro mission. There is no white burden. I find myself suddenly in a world in which things do evil, a world in which I am summoned into battle, a world in which it is always a question of annihilation or triumph.
Okay, so once again, these passages are really dense and need to be understood within the context of the time that he's writing, that he's a psychoanalyst, right? And he's trying to claim a sort of humanity that doesn't rely on a ossified, particularistic past of the African people. That is what he's trying to contest against. Because what he's saying is, what he's trying to suggest is that what we become is with the knowledge of the past. But we don't let that past define who we are. We take that past and make sure that in present that is not repeated. Hence these poetic sentences, right, about the 17th century slave, slavery, about, um, you know, defining just purely an African identity. But what does he mean when he says the black man wants to be like the white man? A lot of people have asked me this question. We can't really understand it without understanding psychoanalysis, right? And even, I would say, read Freire. Because the idea is, if you live in an oppressive system, your subjectivity is constructed through that. Within that, you know your role as the oppressed, but you also know your oppressor. And if you work within the logic of that power, if you're trying to change that world, what you want to become is that person who's oppressing you because that's the only logic you consciously know. What Fanon is saying is, we need to go beyond that, right? And you know, there's a reference to Kant and the stars, supposedly. And that's how Kant got into philosophy, you know, by looking at the immensity of the sky. But what he's saying is that what is his struggle is, and he quotes Sartre there, who basically says that authentic living is when we look at the past critically and incorporate that knowledge into our present. What he's trying to say is, I will not be limited by my past. I will not try to retrieve a particularistic African identity. But if I need that knowledge to fight with my brothers and sisters in solidarity to change the world, I will learn that history. But I will not let that history of ills and grievances and slavery define my actions, because if I do that, I'm still reacting within the logic of power. The idea is to construct a new, freer self, to claim it, right? You can't claim it if you just constantly keep thinking of yourself as a victim. That's what he's trying to say. Now, I'm making all these statements within the context of this essay. The things change. The world in which we live, the vocabularies of resistance have changed, and we have to read Fanon in his own context, but in the context of this book, because the phenomenon of the wretched of the earth is a completely different phenomenon. So what else does he say? Um, so what he's saying is that I am not seeking, I don't want to stamp the pride of my master, and I don't want to dwell on my own victimhood. So I don't, what he's saying is I'm not seeking either a politics of victimhood or seeking to become the oppressor, seeking to become like the people who oppressed my ancestors and me. What he's saying is that there is no particular mission that is purely black or Negro. And there is no burden that is purely white. That dichotomy, he says, may not exist. What he's saying is all I see in this world is evil being trapped. Right? And that's the world in which I live. That's where I'm summoned to do battle. That is my mission. Now keep in mind, the book is entitled Black Skin, White Masks. It starts with the deep psychological trauma of a black self which has to take on and perform an identity in a predominantly white world, okay? So he's not straying far away from his original argument, but towards the end of this book, he's trying to particularize a more humanistic approach to the question of identity, right? May it be black identity or the other. But the question is, how is this world 
in which things do evil, in which I, Fanon, am called to battle, right? And the questions are always binary of annihilation or triumph. What do we do in this world? That is what he is talking about at the end of one of the most influential books in the 20th century. So I'll go and read a little more and then come back and we'll talk about it. I, a man, in a world where words wrap themselves in silence, in a world where the other endlessly hardens himself. No, I do not have the right to go and cry out my hatred at the white man. I do not have the duty to murmur my gratitude to the white man. My life is caught in the lasso of existence. My freedom turns me back on myself. No, I do not have the right to be a Negro. I do not have the duty to be this or that. If the white man challenges my humanity, I will impose my whole weight as a man on his life and show him that I am not that show good eating that he persists in imagining. I find myself suddenly in the world and I recognize that I have one right alone that of demanding human behavior from the other. One duty alone, that of not renouncing my freedom through my choices. I have no wish to be the victim of the fraud of a black world. My life should not be devoted to drawing up the balance sheet of Negro values. There is no white world, there is no white ethic any more than there is a white intelligence. There are in every part of the world men who search. I'm not a prisoner of history. I should not seek there for the meaning of my destiny. I should constantly remind myself that the real leap consists in introducing invention into existence. In the world through which I travel, I'm endlessly creating myself. I'm a part of being to the degree that I go beyond it. And through a private problem, we see the outline of the problem of action placed in this world in a situation embarked as Pascal would have it, am I going to gather weapons? Am I going to ask the contemporary white man to answer for the slave ships of the 17th century? Am I going to be to try by every possible means to cause guilt to be born in minds? Moral anguish in the face of massiveness of the past. I'm a Negro and tons of chains, storms of blows, rivers of expectoration flow down my shoulders, but I do not have the right to allow, allow myself to bog down. I do not have the right to allow the slightest fragment to remain in my existence. I do not have the right to allow myself to be mired in what the past has determined. I'm not the slave of the slavery that dehumanized my ancestors. To many colored intellectuals, European culture has a quality of exteriority. What is more, in human relationships, the Negro may feel himself a stranger to the Western world. Not wanting to live the part of a poor relative, of an adopted son, of a bastard child, shall he feverishly seek to discover a Negro civilization? Let us be clearly understood. I'm convinced that it would be of the greatest interest to be able to have contact with the Negro literature or architecture of the third century before Christ. I should be very happy to know that a correspondence had flourished between some Negro philosopher and Plato, but I can absolutely not see how this fact would change anything in the lives of the eight-year-old children who labor in the cane fields of Martinique and Guadeloupe. No attempt must be made to encase man, for it is his destiny to be set free. The body of history does not determine a single one of my actions. I am my own foundation, and it is by going beyond the historical instrumental hypothesis that I will initiate the cycle of my freedom. The disaster of the man of color lies in the fact that he was enslaved. The disaster and the inhumanity of the white man lie in the fact that somewhere he has killed man. And even today they subsist to organize this dehumanization rationally. But I, as a man of color, to the extent that it becomes possible for me to exist absolutely, do not have the right to like my, lock myself into a world of retroactive reparations. I, the man of color, want only this. 
that a tool never possessed the man, that the enslavement of man by man cease forever, that is of one by another, that is, it be possible for me to discover and to love man wherever he may be. The Negro is not any more than the white man. Both must turn their backs on the inhuman voices which were those of their respective ancestors in order that authentic communication be possible. Before it can adopt a positive voice, freedom requires an effort at disalienation. At the beginning of his life, a man is always clotted. He is drowned in contingency. The tragedy of the man is that he was once a child. It is through the effort to recapture the self and to scrutinize the self. It is through the lasting tension of their freedom that men will be able to create the ideal conditions of existence for a human world. Superiority, inferiority, why not the quite simple attempt to touch the other, to feel the other, to explain the other to myself? Was my freedom not given me then in order to build the world of the hue? At the conclusion of this study, I want the world to recognize with me the open door of every consciousness. My final prayer, O oh my body, make of me always a man who questions. Okay, so there is quite a lot packed in these passages. But here are certain cautionary things to keep in mind. This is Fanon being a humanist, okay? And he has written a book critical of the system within which African and black identity is produced. So don't ever think that he's an apologist for the unjust power system. But what he's trying to do in this parting message is to craft sort of a universalist humanistic message. And that is how we ought to read it as something within the context of the book. And what he's trying to highlight in these last passages, the last sentence, of course, is to make me into a body that asks questions, that I, I remain a critical self. But what he's trying to dispel throughout is this idea that somehow there can be a pure retrieval of one culture or the other, or that, at, that an identity can only be built in through oppositional means where I constantly say my ancestors were enslaved and all. That is a crucial part of history because it plays a role materially in my part of the world, but he's re reading it in psychoanalytical terms. And there is a significance of retrieving silenced cultures. We know that because of post-colonialism, right? Because of current research into how culture impacts the materiality of the world, right? Fanon is slightly dismissive of that, but what he's trying to say is that, yeah, okay, we discover some old correspondence between Plato and an African scholar. That doesn't change the material conditions. There is some point to that, but in the current place where we are today in the world, we already know that retrieving silenced histories, retrieving silenced stories is crucial because it helps us articulate the cultural contribution of silenced constituencies. And by doing so, they become part of active members in the history of any projects. And they will then end up creating the same thing that Fanon desires, a world in which it should not matter what your ethnicity is, what your identity is, where your only identity counts. But there are quite a few challenges here Two, defining identity f only in these oppositional terms and only in particularities of oppression and victimhood and African identity. Part of it is also, Fanon eventually also responds to the Negritude movement and others by suggesting that before we 
develop the United States of Africa, we need to develop national identities. That's in, in the wretched of the earth. So he himself is dealing with it, but this profound ending in which he's trying to claim an unfettered agential humanity beyond race, beyond color, beyond ethnicity, beyond history, I think it's a more strategic claim which basically says is I'm not asking for a place on the table. There is no table. This is a world. We all own it. We all exist in it. I become in it because of my choices. And what I want is a world in which I can make my choices as a black man or as a white man. That's what I think is the crux of this argument. But I always like the poetic nature of this writing. Because what he's saying in these profound lines in his first book is that I am aware of the history and historical injustices and I need to know it to work and to fight in this world in which inequalities still exist but that I'm not going to let the history define my behavior. I will claim my humanity. And remember the sentence where he says, but if the white man denies it to me, I will put the entire burden of my body against it and say, no, I am equally human and exist. Right? So, so Finan, until the end of his days, remains resistant. Right? And this profound ending is not the end of what he will end up doing in his life. But what I wanted to say is that now we are in the Black Lives Movement. We are post the phase where we all insisted and still insist that our histories must be counted, right? That is beyond Fanon. Fanon opens the door to it. Well, we should not point to Fanon as a prophet and saying, well, he didn't believe in that. He obviously believed in assertion of his own identity as a human being, right? That's where ideally he wants to go. But he also knows that the world in which he exists is imperfect and there are inequalities, hence the language of combat. Now, before I end it, just a slight uh, aside that Fanon of the Wretched of the Earth is completely different, okay? He's probably not trying to articulate a kind of universal humanism or become a part of it. He has already chosen a side with the Algerian freedom fighters. Now a lot of people uh, you know, cl suggest that Fanon is a prophet of violence. They don't mm, read him carefully enough. right? He's a psychoanalyst, but he's trying to t teach us is how do you claim your humanity if it has been violently suppressed? And his answer is, you know, by actually supplanting your oppressor, by taking them out, by replacing them. And that's where that kind of um, violence comes into play. So these are some of my thoughts about this excerpt. Uh, as always, I would be happy to hear your ideas, answer your questions, but please do read it carefully. Read it within the context of the book and the time when it was written, 1952. And then read it within the context of our own lives and see how our views of culture and politics have evolved. And what has become of the politics of identity expression and why it is crucial to have all cultures, as Ungugi would say, is have a place for all the flowers to bloom, right? And that's what we learn from Fanon and we build on it. So that is all. Thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.